to create uh, an informative series of, of HR related topics. And I thought, okay, that's, at first he, you know, he wanted me to do it. And it's like, well, you know, I was president of Canon and, and, and all that. I don't know how to do this stuff. So along the way, I met Daniel McKay and uh, Dan, a true HR uh, professional. And we started collaborating, uh, Daniel, myself and, and Dave to create uh, this series. And so this is HR huddles uh, session one, and we hope to have two or three more. And, and over time, even more so than that uh, on various uh, mm -hmm. focus points. So with that, I'll, I, that's all the microphone time I wanted. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Daniel and let him introduce our speakers and, and take the program over from here. Great, right, thanks, Dan. Uh, just a quick kind of process check. I sent a note out on chat. If you are on audio or video as a participant, if you would please mute, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, I will do my best during the session to monitor the chat. So if you've got questions for uh, for the panel, we'll, we'll certainly try to uh, address them. My role is try to grill them as much as possible on the topic. Uh, so, but uh, welcome any questions you may have. As, as Dan mentioned, it's an HR huddle series, and we really want to start with the practical realities of managing through the, the pandemic. And I've got the pleasure of uh, introducing and, and working with um, uh, three folks here in the Hampton Roads area that have played a key role, lead role for their organizations in dealing with the pandemic. The first is Kathy Vick. She's the Chief Development and Government Affairs Officer for the Port of Virginia. We also have Kira Wong, who's the Vice President of Human Resources for Zim Integrated Shipping. And we have Sherry Hewen Epps, who is the Director of Human Resources for Kalanis Shipyard. And uh, I think her video is kind of in and out. So that's one of the practical realities of this is uh, you may hear Sherry, but uh, may not see her throughout, but we'll, we'll do our best to um, go back and forth between each of us. Um, so again, uh, this group is just well versed in this because they've been navigating through the challenges of the pandemic since it started. And we use their feedback and experience to put together this case study to share with, with the group, particularly, you know, if you have uh, small to no HR uh, presence within your organization, hopefully this will provide you with um, some uh, knowledgeable tools and approaches that are going to help you going forward. Uh, one other introduction I wanted to make is uh, we have the benefit of collaborating on this, particularly when we promoted the event with the Hampton Roads Society for Human Resource Management. And Dina Kaur has uh, uh, signed on and particip is participating as well. And she is the president-elect of Hampton Roads, uh, Shern, and going to invite her towards the conclusion of the program uh, for some of her insight on this topic as well. All right, so with that, with the introductions, out of the way, uh, I'm gonna jump right in. And uh, for those of you who think that this may be death by PowerPoint, we have a total of four slides. So we're really gonna get into the, the meat of the case study. But one of the things I wanna do first, and I'm waiting for this to change. There we go. Is I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but this is a list of resources that are available to business owners, leaders in the Hampton Roads, area. Many of them you may be familiar with. Um, I'm sure everyone has been monitoring the CDC and the updates that they're providing on the pandemic, what you can do for cleaning and disinfecting the workspace, um, it, you know, contract tracing and other case management, a lot of information out on their site. If you are just starting to contemplate bringing employees back into the workplace, then the OSHA website has a number of different resources for you. Uh, at the local level, the Hampton Roads Chamber has both resource and recovery guides. And one of the things that may be of interest is they have some recovery grants out there based on each of the cities within Hampton Roads that you may want to review. And then finally, what I'm gonna mention is the uh, 757 Recovery Forum. Uh, it's a, like this webinar, it's, it's a forum of other like-minded uh, business leaders, business owners, subject matter experts, to engage with and collaborate with uh, as you manage through this, this pandemic. Um, so again, we're gonna send this out to the group after the session. So I'm not gonna do a deep dive into each, uh, but with that, I'm gonna pause 
uh, briefly and see uh, with our panel, you know, are there any of these resources listed that you found particularly helpful or if you wanted to highlight a few others um, that uh, you, you leaned on during this process? Sherry, why don't I start with you? Okay, can everyone hear me? We can hear you, Sherry. Okay, good afternoon. So I'll mention two, the two others that come to mind. I think the first FFCRA, Families First Corona Relief Act. Um, many are very likely familiar with that one. Um, and what has been interesting about that at, at Kalana is we, we don't meet the requirements. We're larger than 500 employees, so we don't have to follow that act, but we have relied on it heavily to help shape some of the other new policies and programs that we've been implementing um, so that we really have elected to follow the majority. The other I'll give a really quick, quick plug to um, throughout, you might hear us reference how frequently this informa uh, information changes and updates. And on July 27th, uh, Governor Northern put out um, an ETS, Emergency Temporary Standards. That's something that would be good to Google, but I want to say it went into effect August 1st, and it walks out in great detail. Um, some of the required information, some training, um, categorizing your workplaces for their risk levels, and, and it introduces testing requirements and those things. So we're doing our best to constantly stay caught up and, and learn along the way. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, and again, folks, we'll, we'll add that to the list. The resources will be sent out. Uh, Kathy or Kira, please chime in if you have a, a quick thought on some of the resources. Yeah, Dan, I was also going to say the governor's ETS um, as an organization that has multifaceted types of workplaces. You know, we have folks on the terminals, we have office spaces, um, we have a lot of contractors come on to our terminals to do work every day because we're under construction. It really does give really good guidelines for how to categorize the different areas of work and specific guidelines for how each of those different types of workplaces should be treated and some notification requirements and training for both your own colleagues and then like I said contractors who may be coming and protocols for notice if they have exposures you know you have good control over your own colleagues but other folks coming into your workplace or onto your um, premises having them have notice requirements, I think is also really helpful. And just to piggyback on that real quick, Kathy, to mention that, you know, um, Shira, Sherry at Kalanis, they don't necessarily have to follow some of the things like the F FFCRA, but they're choosing to do that. Uh, you know, at, at organizations like the port and those that are on the call, you may have something similar where you've got certain practices in place that you're, you're having to follow, but your contractors that may come on property may fall under other ones. So the fact that it's got some of that variability based on the type of organization um, on, on the governor's ETS that the Kathy mentioned and Sherry mentioned, uh, definitely a worth, worthwhile resource. Um, Kira, you're not on the hook, but I, you know, if, you want to, if you want to chime in real quick, please do. No, I, I think that you covered all of them. For those organizations, I know Sherry mentioned that she is voluntarily following some of the FFCRA protocols, but I think particularly now for those businesses that have to, Schools are doing their thing in terms of, you know, some are closing, some are virtual, parents have to make choices. As, as the environment changes in that direction, that's been a very valuable resource. We get a lot of questions from employees now trying to figure out their first month of school and their long-term decisions around their students and, and their um, children. So I would definitely encourage people to continue to uh, keep up on the research with that because it, it is ever changing like everything else, but that has been a valuable resource for us to constantly remind her. Nope, you got muted somehow, Kira, sorry. There you go. Oh, that's okay. I'm, I'm, actually, you, um, you or Kathy, because you both kind of touched on, remind me as we get into the, the case study a little bit more, because you're talking about the return to school, and, and I know that there are some, some uh, policies you're putting in place that are helping employees as they're, as they're managing that new wrinkle in the process. So if I get, forget, please please nudge me to, to bring that up again. Um, all right, so um, next slide here, bear with me. 
All right, again, I'm gonna to try to move through this fairly quickly, but recognizing that with the different organizations we may have on the call, you may be at any place on the continuum in terms of where your transition is uh, as an organization, its response to the pandemic. You may still have everybody remote. You may be starting to welcome a percentage back in. Maybe you always had people uh, remain in the office. And really the intention of this slide is when you think back to that March timeframe, uh, how companies handled their transition at that point and how employees received it, uh, if they thought that it was effective and transparent and empathetic, then it, it really is increasing employees' receptivity for the other decisions that you're making uh, going forward. So uh, some of these are referenced in the case study itself in terms of having to go remote quickly. I'll just highlight a couple things. Um, some organizations that uh, were affected through this process, what I heard pretty universally is that they had created a task force. Somebody that, you know, really was taking on the heavy lifting of all these changes through CDC and OSHA and the governor and everything else and running through some scenarios, uh, helping uh, recommend some certain decisions. And if you don't have one now, maybe something that you want to consider as you continue to uh, evolve with the, the pandemic. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention is uh, an emphasis on near-term goals. So any annual goals, performance management process, in some cases, went out the window. Uh, but what we heard a lot from employees is what they really appreciated was companies were still giving them some form of mission over the next one to two months, one to three months. And it gave a lot of clarity while they were dealing with a lot of that ambiguity. So it took some of the pressure off of the initial performance goals, but they still had that direction um, that they could focus on and uh, you know, gave, gave a foundation uh, around how we were dealing with all of this. Uh, so again, uh, trying to quickly go through this, but I'll, I'll open it up for Kathy, Kira, or Sherry to see if, if uh, you wanted to add anything, particularly anything that you thought was really helpful during your initial transition that you're leaning on now that's helping you continue to evolve with the process. Uh, Kira, why don't you start? So when we first went out, um, we had a, a workforce that was about 30% prepared to, to go out, I would say, in terms of equipment, laptop, working from home experience. And so we quickly worked with IT because our decision as a company was to allow remote work across the board. Uh, we, we decided we could do it and that it was feasible with the positions that our employees had, even though we were considered essential personnel and, and in theory, we could have kept our employees safely distanced, of course, in the building. So we quickly worked with IT and we got everybody out as quickly as possible. And, you know, where that has helped us in terms of going through that experience of the, okay, here we are, let's make this happen was that it allowed us time to kind of step back and say, okay, when we put everybody out, we did it very quickly. We kind of threw everybody out to the wolves. We followed up with some training in terms of how to get on the systems, how to work from home, how to work remotely. But because of our initial decision to move everyone out very quickly, it really allowed us the time to, to decide how are we gonna bring people back? And what does that mean from an equipment standpoint? What does that mean from which positions can work remotely standpoint? All of which we took into consideration with our protocols which employees really needed to be in the building to be efficient. And, and by the way, do we really need to bring everybody back right away? And that's a decision we're still going through. So I think our initial response of just get everyone out as quickly as possible allowed us the time to really build a set of protocols for now bringing people back and, and how we transition them back into the building. Thanks. Uh, Kathy, anything there to add? And then Sherry, I'll give you a second and we'll dive into the case. Yeah, so so I would say similarly, um, we have about 2,000 um, direct employees and uh, labor partners who can't telework. So we had a lot of work to do to make sure that the folks who still needed to come to work every day were safe. And so we implemented temperature checks. We implemented um, assigned equipment. So it used to be the equipment would go into a pool. Um, you know, I might drive it one day, Dan, you might drive it the next day, the third day, Kira might drive that piece of equipment. Well, now every day I drive equipment one, two, three, four, you know, and you drive equipment five, six, seven. So to making, 
sure that we know who may have been exposed or who's using um, different pieces of equipment. So that's helped a lot. But I would say one of the things that has really helped us through the whole thing is to survey our colleagues on a regular basis. We sent out a survey at the very beginning, just checking in, how are you doing? How's the transition to teleworking? If you're someone who w was able to go to telework, um, if you're coming to the terminal, what is your, what's giving you anxiety? You know, is it, do you have suggestions for other protocols you'd like to see put into place? And it helped us to gauge how our preparedness and response was being received, how folks were feeling, and it helped keep them engaged in the process and I think give them some comfort. The, in the top two, interestingly, um, on all four surveys that we've done, we're not about coming to work um, necessarily. One was about the economic impact to our business. Um, were they gonna be furloughed? Were they gonna be laid off? And the second has been the, what am I gonna do? Because my kids can't go to school and I have, you know, or daycare over the summer. The, the camps are all closed. I have nowhere for my kids to go. I don't know what I'm gonna do. So that has allowed us to respond in kind and give some comfort around some of those areas and to put some policies in place that uh, is helping um, with the school age children, right. so. All right, well, I, and I promise to come back to the, the school issue and, and Will because that's a situation we have, but you also had some uh, ways to help mitigate that for your employees, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, let me go ahead and transition to the case because we really want to uh, make sure we have time to, uh, to dive into that. And really with our, the intent here was, uh, again, based on some real situations that our panel have dealt with, but to give you kind of a fictitious uh, case study, because we can do all the planning in the world. We just talked about some, and then you have the first incident come out, and now you're like, okay, what, what do I do? And what happens if, you know, a curveball is thrown your way? And, and so we'll try to address some of those curveballs. So I'm not going to read through the case. Everybody had a chance to download it uh, prior to the call, and, and there's a brief summary on the screen. But if we kind of cut to today, we have an organization that went successfully through their transition. They have developed their safety protocols and their mitigating protocols and uh, feel like they've handled that. And now we have uh, the first or one of the first incidents to take place. Uh, but one thing, Kira, I want to ask you, it's great that we've got protocols in place. HR and leadership have developed the protocols, but there, that's the what. But there can be a so what factor if, you know, depending on what employees know about that and their own familiarity with it. And so if you can talk a little bit about how you communicated that out, and if that in many ways didn't actually raise more concern or ambiguity when you started to, you know, provide some of that information about your protocols. So I think um, similar to what, what Kathy mentioned and what I started to say in our terms of our time out, it gave us time to prepare. And by that, I mean, our global HR did help and do surveys similar, you know, how's your equipment running? How's your communication with your manager? Locally, um, I had a team with my, um, my HR manager, Catherine, and my facilities manager, Virgis, and we took the time to walk through the building, kind of say, where do we think our pinch points are? Or if I was an employee, what would I be concerned about? How is our building set up in terms of who should be sitting and where? Where should we close in the building? So we really took the time to kind of do several walkthroughs and we also ongoing consistently had communication with employees, even leading up to the protocols. How are you doing? What are some suggestions for us? What are your concerns? And so we got a lot of employee feedback in terms of, well, I am nervous because I have, I sit in a bullpen and I have 40 of my closest coworkers sitting next to me to, you know, I don't, but I sit all the way in the corner. So what's gonna happen as I have to navigate through, through the building. So we were really able to kind of take all those different pieces into consideration. And you know, we developed what started, you know, I think it was several, like four or five pages, and we really tried to narrow it down to be very, very simple. Return to work protocols. We, we really said, what's the employee, your responsibility? Here are the things we're doing. We, we have a nurse in the morning from this time to this time. She's gonna do a health assessment, take temperatures. 
we, you know, you need a wristband. I had mine on from being at work earlier today. Um, you know, here's where if you're in this side of the building, you exit here. You must wear a mask. We're, we're requiring that it's, it's mandatory. We're providing it for you. You must have hand sanitizer on you. We're providing that. So we really took the time to step by step spell out very simply and clearly what our, our responsibilities were and what are we expecting you to do? We're expecting you to wear the mask. We're expecting you to be follow the directions. We're expecting you to have hand sanitizer. So what we did was we did a couple things. We emailed it out to everybody and um, requested that they sign it and return it. So we knew that they had at least reviewed it and that they had an opportunity to look through it. We also provided it at the front door because our approach, and we're not 100% back, has been to rotate people through and we have about 70 employees coming through from a building that's about almost 300. So we've provided at the door, we have it available for people to read, but we also decided not to rely on that because you know, employees read a protocol and some retain it and some don't. So we have signs up everywhere. Um, Gary, if I could interrupt real quick. I mean, in some cases, that, so this may be obvious to the, to the audience, but you know, communication is key. You know, 80%, yes. I'm sure it's gone up that almost 80% of all problems usually are due to poor communication. So you and Kathy have also mentioned that. I'm just curious in some of the material or information that was communicated, did you start to get some pushback? Was there one particular area that related to temperature checks or where they were located in the office or anything else that really seemed to be a hot button for, uh, for the employees during that stage? That's a good question. And I think the answer to that is the, probably the, the two biggest concerns that I think I saw was one, just the general, um, what happens if I get there and somebody's sick? So we did come up with a protocol for that. What happens if someone gets sick during the day? What the, who they, should they contact? We made a quarantine area or if the person can't drive so we can, we can put them aside and do a health assessment. So that was a big concern. What if I show up and somebody next door gets sick to me? Okay. So and, some uh, of that, some of that part as we get into those details, hold for, for a second, because obviously we got a situation in our case where we've got somebody that's sick. So I want to make sure you got a chance to, to interject within the, within the context of, uh, of that. But just, you know, that I know that, that leaders within HR, outside of HR, throughout this process are trying to communicate as much as they can. That's been somewhat the default, right? Is, is be transparent, communicate what you know, what you don't know. But some cases, you know, that can, that can lead to um, some increased ambiguity as well. And you've got to respond with, with more uh, communication. So, all right. So I keep saying I'm going to pivot to this case study and I mean it. Um, so in this particular case study, we almost have the ideal situation. An employee has a significant other. That part's not ideal. The, the significant other comes down with, with uh, COVID-19, but he or she informs their supervisor. And, you know, that largely is the ideal so that you can have that one-to-one -one discussion. But Sherry, I want to pivot to you. We know in this day and age, sometimes we may not have the ideal. So what if information gets out on social media? What if the significant other had posted something on social media about them, uh, you know, having some exposure to the virus or uh, you know, you start having uh, texting going crazy. So what if, you know, what if that message gets out uh, in less than ideal circumstances? Sure. So absolutely happened in so many, so many instances. I think this is where, because we're, we're building these plans as we go, it's important to remind, so back to communication, but reminding the employees what our current protocol is and um, also give them an option. So for us, this, this scenario, very similar, did occur here. And I'll note that as um, an essential company, we didn't close at all. So we, we haven't had one day, one hour, <laughs> one hour off. We 0% um, remote workforce. So all 750 people um, stayed and we just had to continue to work through um, other safety precautions. So what we did here is we reminded individuals of what the protocol was and what the options were. So for us, we were covering pay, paid time off, if you met a certain um, criteria or you were in close personal contact for more than 15 minutes without a mask, performing work, and if so, tell us a bit about that interaction. There were others and those individuals went out for said time, paid time, and we supported that. 
But there was a group of six or so that overheard this and said, oh my gosh, this is crazy. We're not coming to work. You don't care about us. We certainly tried to calm their fears because we understood that that, that could have been very real. But we gave them their option, which was, okay, if, if you choose to go out of work um, and you haven't met the co potential exposure criteria, then that time, unfortunately for you, will be unpaid and it'll be for a period of 14 days because that's our, once you say I'm, I'm concerned about exposure and I don't want to get a test, that's the quarantine time required at home. And for our employees, highly production, highly hourly um, environment, there were very, well, quite frankly, there were none in that situation. Um, and they came back and said, thanks for explaining. Um, part of it was saying the shop's been wiped down. Here's the scenario. We do not have an employee who's positive. We have uh, a, a spouse or a girlfriend of a employee who's positive, and we were able to calm their fears with options and communication. So, Kathy, I'm going to pivot to you a little bit. It's kind of a double-barreled question um, because I think you've got uh, kind of two different approaches that that you um that you put into practice one let's come back to the school uh so in the in the you've got the school situation and, and you all uh, developed some policies on how to help employees with that but in this particular case also you've got employees expressing concern uh, about being exposed even under alleged circumstances to another employee that may have been exposed and uh, you've got some um, kind of pan, a pandemic policy around paid time off as well. So if you, if you don't mind kind of addressing each of those two and particularly that latter one, the paying time off and how it might apply to this situation. Yeah, sure. So we did put into place a, a pandemic policy and it applies to um, known exposure or if a, a colleague traveled to a hot spot and it was afraid to come back to work because they were afraid they might have been exposed and are gonna you know spread it or or what have you then we said for you have 14 days of paid time off under this pandemic policy but once you've taken it you've taken it so if you do it out of fear and then later you truly are exposed or you test positive and you have to go out then that's going to be you're gonna to have to either burn your already earned paid time off of your, of your own or have to take it off unpaid. So we may be a little bit more flexible, but also stern and, and it's 14 days, that's it. Um, so the other policy that we put into place was um, for folks who were teleworking was a plan your day policy. So if you have school age children and you're trying to navigate um, helping them with their virtual learning, which a lot of us know in the spring was um, I'll call challenging to say the least. There was a lot of like, uh, synchronous virtual learning. So um, the kids were on their own a lot and needed more direction. Um, or if they were out of things to do, like I know a lot of elementary school children in the springtime at least were getting like one hour's worth of work a day and then they're just hanging out. So um, we did a plan your day policy that said you can work with your supervisor to plan different hours than your usual nine to five within which you work. So if you wanna get up at six and work six to 10, and then maybe spend time with your children, helping them from 10 to four, and then your spouse can get home or someone else, you know, then you can make up the rest of your hours starting at four o'clock. As long as your work is getting done and your supervisor is aware of what the expectation is for when you're available and when you're achieving your work. So, um, we rolled out the plan your day policy uh, to help folks and back to the communication piece. We tried to always like four or five days in advance of rolling it out to everyone in the organization, roll it out to our HR business partners and our supervisors so that they had a forum to ask questions and we could put together a frequently asked questions about each policy 
so that there could be some consistency in the way that it was being applied and the way folks were answering questions about each of the new policies that we rolled out. And, you know, another theme throughout this, you know, it's going to keep coming up communication, but also the flexibility. So in some cases, you may not have a policy that you created back in March or April because the situation didn't present itself. And, and so being nimble and agile through that obviously is going to is going to be key. Um, so Kira, uh, Sherry brought up a little bit, and I think some of the others is there are some circumstances, maybe interactions that start to get close to uh, some of the CDC guidelines in terms of, hey, 15 minutes of exposure and what have you. Uh, talk a little bit about what do you see as a sufficient amount of evidence to suggest that uh, you would have an employee or employees tested? And what happens if an employee refuses to take the test? So we um, have kind of what I would consider a, a tracing committee. And I have to say, we, we have had employees be very transparent and very very forthright with us. We've also had a lot of employees working from home. So in the cases when employees say, hey, listen, I've been in contact with somebody in my house, they've tested positive, we've been operating under a presumptive positive, and we say, okay, you live with this person, that is more than enough evidence for us that before you come back in the building, there, there needs to be, to be a test. We've had cases, just trying to give specific examples, where someone has said, I've been in the same room with somebody. I had, didn't have a mask on and we were six feet apart or less. That to us is also um, enough exposure, unless they were passing through in, in an open room. Uh, we're similar to what Sherry, sa Sherry said. If you've been in a room with somebody that's been exposed and you do not have a mask on and you were not beyond six feet, then uh, and there was some significant level of time, then that to us is also test worthy. But I, I have to add, our employees are, are voluntarily testing. So while we do have it in our protocol that if you've been in a room unmasked with somebody who's been exposed, that's enough evidence for us to, to say you need to, to go get a test. Our employees are doing it voluntarily and they're telling us, I've been in a room, I'm going to get tested and we work with them and most of them are working from home still. So for us, it, it's not been an issue in terms of trying to get employees to test. Now, if an employee says they won't test and they've had that exposure that we consider our threshold, I would just encourage employers to talk to the employee. They're, you know, what is their fear about getting tested? Why are they saying they won't? Is there any ADA issues that may to be taken into consideration? Um, are there any accommodations that need to be taken into consideration? And really kind of get through why, why an employee feels like they, they won't test. Now, we have it in our protocols that it's a requirement. And we also have in our protocols that refusal to follow the policy in order to return to work in terms of testing, providing a, a negative test, um, quarantining at our as what we feel necessary is subject to discipline action because I think you kind of have to have it out there that, that this is very serious and the employer is going to take it serious. But you know, before you go that way, I think employees are kind of scared and they're not sure and everyone has different feelings. So I recommend a conversation and, and just talk about why. And by the way, for an employer like me who's under the FFCRA, if they want that or need that two weeks paid, they do have to make some certifications, which might require testing or going and seeing a doctor. And sometimes I think they don't understand that, that it's not a matter of just deciding you want to take two weeks paid if you feel you can't work or you can't come in and you're required to come in at your, at your shift that week. Um, they really have to take some of these steps to get tested if they even want to meet the threshold of getting some of these extra benefits. So while I've not had that experience personally, I, re I recommend employers have that in their protocol, what their threshold is, what they're gonna do if an employee does not do it. But in this day and age with nervousness and how employees are feeling, engagement I think is the key and conversations with employees and figure out why. If you, if you think you're sick or you've had exposure, why wouldn't you wanna go get that and see if you can well, help and, navigate that. I think you highlighted a key thing there is that yes, the, the, the HR departments or leaders within an organization have to administer a lot of these protocols, but in some cases they're not just to adhere to the protocol because we develop one. And so we're going to adhere to it. But in some cases, it's for the benefit uh, of the employees if they're getting added benefits through FFCRA or other, uh, or other circumstances. Um, Sherry, I'm going to pivot a bit to uh, maybe the more extreme or more um, negative side here. But, you know, we've got employees at this stage in the case study that the rumor mill is totally firing and they've heard that somebody's been exposed and they don't want to work 
and you've got people that are starting to refuse to work, but you're expecting them in the in the work environment. Um, it can impact productivity. At what stage do you start to have to think about uh, discipline and, and how do you best handle through that, that situation? Okay. So we have, again, learning on the fly, real life scenario, what happened uh, for us is after someone returned, they were out on a um, suspected exposure, were negative and returned to work. Well, because of HIPAA requirements and trying to respect the individual's privacy, we weren't sharing everything, but people talk and they all knew that John Smith wasn't there. Well, when he did return, then HR has 10 people in our office saying, I'm not gonna work with the guy. And in the next office, the gentleman is there saying, um, my peers are treating me like an leper, leper. They're picking on me, nobody wants to work with me. So we went back to good old communication, explaining to the 10 that were saying, I'm leaving, walking out, this is unsafe. We had to explain to them again what our protocol was and why this individual was um, approved to work. So they were given, we took a tougher stance there and explained, um, we need you to return to work today. If not, you'll be using any PTO time you have available. And if not, we'll, we'll handle this as unplanned absence and um, for us, discipline. So um, there are just so many different, different unanticipated, I guess, loopholes that are there um, that, that we're really managing along the way. Um, now, was one part of this the, the extreme, kind of the discipline extreme too, Dan? Did you want to hear a little about that? Yeah, um, you know, obviously we don't want that situation. And, and um, you know, Kira had an opportunity to be a good cop here where most a lot of people who are complying with the, with the protocols but you know those that are in the audience may have a situation where it just it escalates towards again the person's feeling retaliation or you've got people that are refusing to work and it, you know we, we may now have to get into some form of, of discipline and hopefully this isn't the case but maybe escalates to dismissal okay and so how uh particularly for the audience how for hr or these leaders if they don't hate, have hr um, support should they could they manage through this very sensitive situation so for us our protocols all state that you must remain in contact with HR and be responding to HR's requests whether that is the request um, you know to share your your test results with a select few or to let us know unfortunately I'm still ill um, I don't feel well enough to return whatever that is there has to be some contact uh, we have had a number, a very small number, but albeit more than one, um, employees who have said, I need to go out, I refuse to be tested. So we put them on the 14 day period and were, they were advised they had to remain in touch with HR. And despite multiple calls and texts and emails, um, they went past the 30 day mark with no response. So what we opted to do in those situations was send them a letter um, with expressing our concern of job abandonment, giving them three days to respond. And if they didn't, then we did disposition them in our system. So we ended up terming a small number of employees who went beyond 30 days. They um, initially left on a suspected case um, and they were, they were essentially terminated. Now that can certainly sound harsh. We did our best effort to try to make sure that it wasn't a situation where the person became so ill they couldn't return the phone call. Of course, if that were to be the case, um, the person would be eligible for rehire. What we have heard is that some of these individuals elected to go find another job or to rely on, um, you know, quite frankly, at some of our hourly jobs, our, um, the unemployment made it enticing to um, to not necessarily immediately return to work. So we saw a bit of that and have had to use discipline in, in a very minor number of cases. One quick process note, um, we're gonna try to have some Q&A here at the end. So uh, for the audience, if you wanted to uh, provide any questions you may have, feel free to start adding them into the, to the chat. Um, I might try to get to them while we're wrapping up the case here. Uh, but if not, we'll try to get to as many as we can towards the end. So feel free to, to uh, add some of those into the chat. Um, Kathy, I want to give you an opportunity to, to perhaps uh, add a little bit to uh, Sherry in terms of when it, when it may escalate into discipline. 
with, with an added wrinkle also is uh, for many organizations, they may have employees that live and or work in other states. And you might have conflicts between the company protocols and state requirements. And, you know, how does that influence how you might manage through a case like this? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the discipline first because we, we had a little bit different scenario that folks may run into that I want to touch on. We've had a staggered teleworking schedule for our folks in the office. Um, initially, we were all telework, but then when we got into phase three, because we were sort of tracking uh, the governor's phases and said, once we get to this, we'll do something different. Um, and we had folks who, um, frankly, were just really enjoying teleworking and decided they were going to do it all the time. Um, how fun is it to work from home, right? Um, and now, let me not downplay the fact that there were some folks who had serious anxiety and fear, and they didn't want to return to the office because of that. Um, so I would say, first of all, you have to take things on a case by case basis. Um, if you have someone, and I communicated that very clearly to my team, if, if you have someone at home who's immune deficient and you're just really afraid of any additional exposure, fine. Um, but some folks were saying they were afraid to come to the office, but then, you know, on social media, were out at a restaurant or a bar or then took PTO and went to Florida, like flew on a plane, biggest hot spot in the country, right? So you have to be mindful of that as well, because I had other colleagues coming and saying, hey, he's not not coming into the office because he's afraid he's, you know, doing all these things. So um, I had to, um, I sort of caught one of them saying he was teleworking and then he was not. And so told him, you know, I'm docking your PTO for the day, or I can take it as an unexcused absence, but it's going in your file. You know, we've had to sort of rein some folks in. So um, definitely just have to take it on a case by case basis, uh, communicate your expectations and hold folks accountable. Um, Cause it really does, you don't wanna curtail the folks who honestly have a fear or a medical situation from coming forward because of the behavior of others. So um, that's one thing. When on the different states and the different requirements, um, if you have offices that are in different places, really it's the same, right? Like it could be different. The level of risk could be higher because of the number of cases that have been seen in that particular area. And there may be um, things that you agree with your governor or not, or your health department in that state or not, but you really can't necessarily have a one size fits all policy. And you also, you may have, for instance, we have some employees that um, work in North Carolina, but come to our facilities in Virginia. And so they were asking us questions about that. Like we are on a stay at home order. Northam says safer at home. You're telling people to stagger telework, but we, we feel like to comply with our governor, we need to still stay home, home. So, you know, you just have to work through those situations and be mindful as you're setting up protocols in your different facilities if they're located in different areas um you know if you need to do more heightened um protocols in some areas because of the regulations that have been put in place in that in that state and, or locality in some instances really hey, hey dan Yes, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, on that note, um, California, um, so for those who are on the call, if, if your company operates in California, which is pretty notorious for being very um, employer employee friendly, uh, some of their state requirements conflict with Governor Northam's um, BTS that he put out. So it's just to, to, to Kathy's point um, about staying uh, you know, staying up to speed and continually educating ourselves as HR professionals or, or just any, you know, work professional. Those are things that, um, that that's just a reminder. I'll throw that state out there. Um, and, and we're still trying to figure out, do we have to respond as the companies based in Virginia? Can we follow those standards or do we have to flex with um, 
each state. But, you know, I'll also add, since I'm talking about how really the, all of the nuances that we've figured out in the last six or seven months, I think it's important for all of us to, to know that there's things that we don't know. Um, new questions are going to come up every single time. You know, every, really, it feels like every day, but at least every week. And we have to be forgiving and um, just continue to, to move forward and communicate as best we can and learn along the way. I think that's really important so that we don't drive ourselves crazy because it's new to every single one of us. Yeah, Dan, if I can jump in on that, like I, I would encourage your supervisors to or your HR business partners to do regular check-in calls. Like it shouldn't be that the only time your folks hear from you is when you're rolling out a new protocol or when you're telling them they're not following it, right? Like I had to put folks on a rotation where, you know, just put yourself down to check on four people this week, call one person a day and just, how are you? How's your family? Like what's going on over there, right? Like, how are you feeling about this teleworking thing? Like, is there anything I can do to support you? You know, things like that. Like, I just feel like that goes a long way with folks. And then they're more likely to be more open and to be more accepting of the protocols and things you're putting into place. My, uh, I had teams uh, around the organization too, who had like virtual happy hours every Wednesday at four, where they just touched base with each other. Um, and had sort of spontaneous thinking, right? Because you miss that, that, you know, you're walking down the hall and, oh, I was in this meeting and I've been meaning to ask you, you know, that sort of thing. You, you lose a lot of that. And so I think creating some forums and some moments where folks can do that helps them feel engaged and connected as well. I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, purposely for this case study, we, we tried to address the curveballs because you're you know you're going to continue to be developing policies and protocols and and new situations are going to arise you know given this somebody might be in North Carolina and their their state has uh, a more strict policy in terms of going to work and you know we can't assume that they're being resistant to it it may be that there are other factors and so being open to that is key. Um, Kira, I want to give you a chance to respond, but I did want to, I want to give Dina Core again, the president-elect with the Hampton Roads uh, SHRM since we, to uh, talk a little bit, because one of the things we just addressed is, you know, different legalities, different policies. And so for this audience that may have limited access to, to HR resources, there's a lot of, um, you know, resources just here in Hampton Roads that are readily accessible. Uh, so, Dina, if, if you don't mind uh, kind of highlighting some of those and then welcome any other uh, insights you have as it relates to uh, the case study. Great. So, thank you for allowing me to participate in your call. I have to tell you, all of you shared some amazing information, um, great insight in pulling it together. So, Hampton Road Sherm, um, we are a resource. You don't have to be a member to take advantage of our resources. You may want to bookmark our page. Um, we have a membership that consists of a lot of experts in the field. Attorneys um, are one of them, and they are always sharing information, free information. So um, on your resources page, you gave a lot of great links. Um, I would also encourage you to contact Find out, um, contact your attorneys that you use for your employer um, cases or just employer um, resource. They're offering free webinars. All of them have websites and some of them, you don't even have to be their client to utilize those. So Jackson Lewis, um, Van D, Vendor Black, um, even your insurance brokers are offering all, they all have COVID resource pages with free resources and additional links. Um, so again, there's a ton of free information out there. If you just got general questions, um, they're all offering free webinars to stay current because this information is changing daily. I, early on, you guys mentioned the, the emergency standard and that's gotta be implemented within the next 60 days. So um, we, SHRM just offered, HR SHRM just offered two back-to-back -back webinars about dealing with COVID and now understanding the standard. Um, and what we have to do as HR to get that standard implemented and train our employees. But you guys have done a really great job of sharing information. Um, again, HR SHRM is available as a resource. We partner with the Chamber too um, for HR Department of One. 
Um, for those of you, you know, that might not have a specific HR department, you're kind of wearing multiple hats um, and you don't know where to go for information, reach out to us. Um, all of us have our addresses posted um, on the HR Sherm page. We're happy to answer your questions. And then, you know, when we're able to meet, we'd love to have you all come out, just see what we're about. Um, and there might be a topic that um, is of interest to you all. So thank you for including us today. Thank you, Dina. And, and just, you know, just a quick plug. I mean, we're all here in Hampton Roads and there's a lot of different organizations, but you know, the Hampton Roads Innovation Collaborative, this all was born out of wanting to help uh, you know, the companies within this area. And so you've got a collaboration with HR Sherm and the chamber and everything else. And you know, we intend to look for opportunities to, to offer more of these kind of real you know, real case, real time situations that are out there. Uh, but Kira, I didn't want to leave you in the lurch. You know, I'm thinking about kind of best lessons learned. We, we dealt with the curveballs, but you know, is there a party shot here in terms of um, getting to resolution? Is there one resource or approach that you found uh, to be particularly uh, helpful uh, in these types of situations? So I think um, for us, you know, it's a lot of it has been um, like taking the feedback and really listening to it. So here's one example that comes to mind. When we first started bringing people back, we put aside and identified people who might have immediate childcare issues, people who might have health conditions or people at their house with health conditions. And we really brought volunteers back first. And um, two months later, it's primarily still the volunteers that are there and they're looking around going, I volunteered, but I didn't think I was gonna be the only volunteer. So we had to do kind of a process check of ourselves. Like we started off, I think with best practices, but we as HR people need to reevaluate do our best practices really hold through as, as the environment changes? So we took a step back and kind of reevaluated and heard the feedback. And we're working with the department managers to say, okay, there are people out there who may not have volunteered initially, but can we look at doing more of a rotation and, and trying to be fair and consistent to all employee in our, in our new world as we go forward? So if I had invite advice, I would say, engage your employees, but then listen and check yourself. And make sure that what you decided two months ago still makes sense today, knowing what we know now. And I think we always need to remind ourselves that, you know, what's the right decision today may not be the right decision tomorrow. And if we're not double checking our decision making, we could find ourselves in a bind or with unhappy employees. Because at the end of the day, you know, I think my company, it sounds like other companies have done a great job. Let's not lose the, the momentum we've had with the employee engagement and keeping our employees safe and healthy and, and engaged um, by continuing to make the, the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. So double check yourselves, double check your processes, and uh, make sure you're still operating in, in today's environment, not in two months ago's environment. Great, thanks. And you know, this was, each of you kind of mentioned this throughout. Um, you know, a lot of times where it may be resistance, and I know we kind of picked on the, the employees in this case, and you know, there may have been a discipline issue. You know, there's an air of fear and ambiguity out there. And sometimes that's what's influencing what may be counterproductive behavior. And they're not just necessarily being disagreeable to be disagreeable. And so getting back to check ourselves to do that. Um, my, my thanks to those that sent me questions uh, privately. I know we're coming up towards the end here. So a couple of things uh, for attendees. It is our intention to send you out the slides afterwards and we'll try to update those with some of the feedback from the panel. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Kira and Kathy and Sherry uh, for offering. I mean th th this is this case although you know it was uh, fake so to speak it's based on real things that they're that they're going through and we know that everyone's going through and, and wanted to in kind of a neutral setting uh, have the audience be able to go through that. So my thanks for y'all sharing your stories and and the challenges that you went through with that. Um, so with really roughly about a, a minute left, um, Dan Bell, if, if you had some parting comments, um, uh, feel free to, to join in, but just really thankful to the panel, thankful to HRIC uh, for letting uh, put this on and, and Concursive also sponsoring it and, and getting some support locally from HR Sherm as well. Uh, the only thing I, I have to say is that I think it was a great session. I wanna thank you, Daniel, for your leadership on this and, and the panel participants were all um, excellent. So I will send out the, uh, the final slides to the email list that I have of registrants. And I want to thank everybody again for, for joining us and, and look forward to seeing you for session two 
on, on the to be determined topic on a to be determined date and time. Great. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, Thank thanks you. for letting me drive and have a great remainder of the day. I appreciate it. Good stuff. Thanks. Take care.